The Deeds of the Divine Augustus is a primary source document about the life of Caesar Augustus, the first emperor of Rome. With minor exceptions near the end, it is a first-person, autobiographical account in which Augustus relates what he saw as the crowning achievements of his rule in the empire. As the primary document, Deeds of the Divine Augustus is of the genre called propaganda. Propaganda is information communicated with the purpose of advancing a particular political viewpoint. At their most innocent, propaganda communications should be treated as biased reports. At their worst, they can be outright misleading. The original Deeds of the Divine Augustus contains 35 paragraphs about the accomplishments of Caesar Augustus. We have reproduced a number of them here interspersed with appropriate commentary. The original document was included as part of Augustus's will, with instructions that it be engraved on the front of his tomb. As with much propaganda, the deeds of the divine Augustus was reproduced often. Many copies were made both in Latin and Greek. We will consider just a few of the document's paragraphs here. The document begins with a preamble. A copy below of the deeds of the divine Augustus, by which he subjected the whole wide earth to the rule of the Roman people, and the money which he spent for the state and Roman people, inscribed on two bronze pillars which are set up in Rome. Two years after the assassination of Julius Caesar in 42 BC, the Roman Senate decreed that the former leader be referred to as a Roman god. As the adopted son of Julius Caesar, Augustus often referred to himself as the Son of God. This term has no relation to the Christian concept of Jesus Christ, but it was by this tradition that he refers to himself here as Divine Augustus. In production of this piece of propaganda, Augustus has immediately set out to establish his purpose. He sees himself as a beneficent leader. Though he ruled as an absolute monarch, he begins by noting how much money he has spent on behalf of the Roman people. The name of Caesar Augustus before he became emperor was Octavian. He acquired many other names, including Caesar and Augustus, over the course of his life. To be accurate, we will refer to him in the accounts of his earlier life by his name at that time, Octavian. In my nineteenth year, on my own initiative and at my own expense, I raised an army with which I set free the state which was oppressed by the domination of a faction. For that reason, the Senate enrolled me in its order by laudatory resolutions when Gaius Panza and Aulus Hirtius were consuls, assigning me the place of a consul in the giving of opinions, and gave me the imperium. With me as pro-praetor, it ordered me, together with the consuls, to take care lest any detriment befall the state. But the people made me a consul in the same year, when the consuls each perished in battle, and they made me a triumvir for the settling of the state. Octavian was nineteen years old when Julius Caesar was assassinated. He here speaks of his great magnanimity in taking initiative with his own money to liberate Rome. What he doesn't tell us is that the money he spent here was almost exclusively from the vast riches he inherited from Julius Caesar. Prior to Caesar's death and the reading of his will, Octavian had no idea he was to be adopted and given this vast estate. He mentions here the positions he was afforded in Rome. Imperium refers to his power to command the army, and Propraetor was a position just below but similar to the role of consul. Most important here is his reference to the triumvir. Octavian was one of three members established as the second triumvirate in Rome. You will remember the first triumvirate was an unofficial league composed of Julius Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus, a league which those three men created of their own design that eventually fell apart. The second triumvirate was officially enacted by the Roman Senate. What Octavian does not mention here, or in the paragraphs to follow, was the fact that his fellow triumvirs were his eventual enemies, Mark Antony and Marcus Lepidus. He also omitted that the Senate declared them as a second triumvirate when the three marched on Rome with their armies in tow. 
I drove the men who slaughtered my father into exile with a legal order, punishing their crime, and afterwards, when they waged war on the state, I conquered them in two battles. Notice how the other members of the Triumvirate are passed over in this paragraph. Octavian would have us to believe that he avenged the death of Julius Caesar single-handedly. In the initial battle of Philippi, it was actually Mark Antony who made a stronger show against the assassins. In the end, both Cassius and Brutus, the leaders of the assassins' men, committed suicide. I often waged war, civil and foreign, on the earth and sea, in the whole wide world, and as victor, I spared all the citizens who sought pardon. As for foreign nations, those which I was able to safely forgive, I preferred to preserve than to destroy. About 500,000 Roman citizens were sworn to me. I led something more than 300,000 of them into colonies, and I returned them to their cities, after their stipend had been earned, and I assigned all of them fields or gave them money for their military service. I captured 600 ships, in addition to those smaller than triremes. In this one paragraph, Octavian has skipped over about 15 years worth of history. His reference to battles here appears to relate to the Battle of Actium, where he defeated his one-time colleague, Mark Antony, by which he secured the role of the Empire for himself. By this time, Marcus Lepidus, who never gained influence in the Second Triumvirate, had already been exiled. When the dictatorship was offered to me, both in my presence and my absence, by the people and Senate, when Marcus Macellus and Lucius Aruntius were consuls, I did not accept it. I did not invade the curatorship of grain in the height of the food shortage, which I so arranged that within a few days I freed the entire city from the present fear and danger by my own expense and administration. When the annual and perpetual consulate was then again offered to me, I did not accept it. A dictator in Rome was not originally in line with how we use the term today. In the days of the Republic, a dictator was a man appointed by the duly elected consuls who was given special powers during the crisis for a limited period of time. A Julius Caesar had been proclaimed dictator for life, and Octavian likely refused the title for fear of being associated with the concentration of power. Not that he opposed power concentrated in himself, he just wanted to avoid the appearance. The third century Roman historian Cassius Dio wrote of Octavian. As for the dictatorship, however, he did not accept the office, but went so far as to rend his garments when he found himself unable to restrain the people in any other way, either by argument or enemy. For, since he was superior to dictators in the power and honors he already possessed, he properly guarded against the jealousy and hatred which the title would arouse. According to Cassius Dio, Octavian saw himself as already superior to the role of dictator, and made great protests against wanting to adopt such a title. In the next few omitted paragraphs, Augustus wrote of the honors afforded him by the Senate, many of which he refused in humility. When my sons Gaius and Lucius Caesar, whom fortune stole from me as youths, were fourteen, the Senate and Roman people made them consuls designate on behalf of my honor so that they would enter that magistracy after five years. And the Senate decreed that on that day when they were led into the forum, they would be included in public councils. Moreover, the Roman knights together named each of them first of the youth and gave them shields and spears. This paragraph relates to one of the few sad elements in Octavian's life captured here. Though he was married three times, his only natural offspring was a daughter, Julia. In 17 BC, the age of 46, he adopted his son-in-law Agrippa and his two grandsons, Gaius and Lucius, who were then three and less than one year old. All three of these adopted sons died, Agrippa in 12 BC, Lucius in AD 2, and Gaius in AD 4. This paragraph relates the honors paid to these lost heirs. This ends the first section of Deeds of the Divine Augustus. 
The next several paragraphs enumerate many of the donations Augustus made in the form of money, land, and food to the people of Rome and to the soldiers. Three times I gave shows of gladiators under my name, and five times under the name of my sons and grandsons. In these shows, about 10,000 men fought. Twice I furnished under my name spectacles of athletes gathered from everywhere, and three times under my grandson's name. I celebrated games under my name four times, and furthermore, in the place of other magistrates, twenty-three times. As master of the college, I celebrated the secular games for the College of the Fifteen with my colleague Marcus Agrippa. Twenty-six times under my name, or that of my sons and grandsons, I gave the people hunts of African beasts in the circus, in the open, or in the amphitheater. In them, about 3,500 beasts were killed. In addition to his donations of money, land, and food, Augustus also provided entertainment for the people at his own expense. Here, mention is made of gladiatorial combat in which men would fight to the death with other men or animals. Amid the brutality of reporting about gladiators, we also see the emperor's softer side as he once again introduces the memory of his deceased son-in-law and two grandsons, whose names were used in offering up these public spectacles. I gave the people a spectacle of a naval battle, in the place across the Tiber where the Grove of the Caesars is now, with the ground excavated in length 1,800 feet, in width 1,200, in which 30 beaked ships, biremes or triremes, but many smaller, fought among themselves, in these ships, about 3,000 men fought in addition to the rowers. Among the entertainments staged for the spectators, Augustus arranged for a basin to be dug of the dimensions indicated, which was then flooded with water. 3,000 men then reenacted naval battles fought between the Athenians and the Persians some 400 years earlier. The remaining paragraphs describe the military accomplishments of the Roman Empire under Augustus and the lands that were added to his command. All this is followed by a few brief paragraphs added after the emperor's death, summarizing other expenditures and public works. <laughs>